Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the SEEP Avian Training Video Series. Uh, I'm DJ McNeil, the uh, instructor for this online course, as well as one of the SEEP uh, field crew leaders. Remember, if you have any questions about anything in this video or any of the others, to send me an email. Uh, and if you're watching this video, you most likely uh, already have my email. As the title of this presentation suggests, in this, uh, this version, we're going to cover the cardinalids, uh, that is the, the, essentially the top row of birds here, the blackbirds, uh, and the finches. Okay, jumping right on into it, we're going to begin with the indigo bunting. The indigo bunting is a pretty easily identified bird. Uh, the male, as you can see here on the left, has this bright uh, blue plumage, uh, particularly bright blue near the base of the bill. Uh, the female, in contrast, can be a little tricky, uh, but she tends to be this kind of warm, uh, tannish brown, um, occasionally with some highlights of blue in the wings uh, or the tail, but not always. Um, we're going to talk about the brown-headed cowbird <clears throat> towards the end of this talk, and uh, the brown-headed cowbird and the indigo bunting female uh, are two of the most plainly colored uh, small passerines that we encounter on a regular basis. Uh, they don't really have a lot of markings, no stripes, no streaks, no, no patterns of really uh, to speak. Um, but their plainness uh, tends to work in your favor, really, uh, using the fact that they have very few markings as, as a distinguishing feature. Uh, so that's visual identification, pretty straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> one final thing to note about the visual. Uh, first, uh, the first breeding season, which is called the second year for birds, uh, for males, they they don't look like this. Uh, essentially, it'll look like a female uh, with blue feathers kind of patchily coming in throughout. So imagine if you mixed the feathers of these two up um, such that there were patches of blue uh, throughout the head and, and breast, uh, that, that would be a, a, a second year um, indigo bunting male. As for the song, it's uh, pretty easy. Uh, the, it's a complex kind of finch-like song. However, one thing that's diagnostic about it is all of the notes are given in pairs. And the mnemonic that I learned for the indigo bunting, because it's in pairs, uh, would be fire, fire, where, where, here, here, now. You can hear it's a little bit more complicated than the mnemonic, but it fits reasonably well. The next bird we're going to talk about is the northern cardinal. For visual identification of the cardinal, uh, it hardly needs uh, much description. Our, our males are bright red, uh, and our females tend to be pretty much brown. Um, Although the females are brown, they have uh, reddish colored tail feathers, flight feathers, and a bit on the crest. Both sexes have a red bill, and both sexes have kind of a dark color uh, at the base of the bill, either black or gray for the female. Uh, and <clears throat> they're pretty good-sized birds uh, with a very massive bill. Uh, they would be uh, really what you would think of as a gross beak, essentially. Uh, the calls are also um, pretty easy to identify. Uh, they're they're quite variable. Uh, that's kind of the tricky thing. However, they all have the same kind of tone and quality to them. These very like pretty uh, whistling type notes, uh, and many of them include some sort of pretty, 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 pretty in them. And here's another bird. And here's another individual. And notice how rich these notes are. Mm -hmm. 
One subtle caveat with the cardinal, during our point count surveys, we note whether the bird is male or female, and if it's singing, you can usually denote that it's just a male, uh, because typically most birds, only the male sings. However, the cardinal is well known for uh, male and female both singing. Here's an example of a male and female singing a duet back and forth with the female singing first. Moving along, the scarlet tanager. Uh, much like the, the cardinal, the scarlet tanager is pretty easy to identify. Males are bright red, black tail, and black wings. Uh, most people are familiar with the red-winged blackbird. I like to think of the scarlet tanager as the black-winged redbird. The female scarlet tanager is essentially a, a replica of the male. However, the wings have sort of a greenish blush to them. They're still dark, notice. Uh, we've got these dark wings. You can even think of them as maybe black wings. Uh, but they've got kind of greenish hue to them. And then the bird overall is greenish on the back with a yellow belly. Um, essentially just a, a muted down uh, uh, version of the male. The size and shape are roughly uh, going to be the same. As for the vocals, um, this one's pretty easy. So I've, I'm going to play the American Robin for you first because this is one that I compare to the Robin. So remember the Robin has a very like sing-songy, rich, cheerily, cheerio, cheery. Now, paying attention to the quality of those notes, the Scarlet Tanager, which I'm going to play next, sounds somewhat like a robin that's got a bit of a sore throat because it has a, a burry quality to the notes. So here's the robin one more time. Clear, metallic notes. The Scarlet Tanager is a little richer and a little burrier. Here's another individual. The other note that the Scarlet Tanger produces, both male and female, is the, the chick burr. And as far as I know, the only bird that produces a chick burr in our study area is the scarlet tanager. They can just produce the chick sometimes. Okay, next moving on to the summer tanager. Summer tanagers are not terribly common in our study area, and they're only found in the extreme southern sites uh, near Maryland and, and western, southwestern Pennsylvania. And for that reason, <clears throat> we're not going to spend a lot of time on the summer tanager. But a few things to note, uh, we've got an overall different shape. Uh, we almost got a crest going on uh, with this bird. Uh, we've also got red wings uh, and a red tail, unlike the scarlet tanager, which had black in those areas. The female uh, has corresponding yellow instead of that like dark colored, almost black tail and wings that we saw in the female scarlet. And as for the song, it tends to be sweeter than the scarlet tanager and tends to be a bit less predictable. So here are some summer tanagers. Okay, moving on to the rose-breasted grosbeak. So the rose-breasted grosbeak is actually a fairly common bird in our study area. And uh, it's, it's pretty large, um, bigger than the scarlet tanager, uh, and it's got a very heavy bill. Uh, visually, uh, the bird's pretty straightforward to identify. We've got a white underside and a black a top part. We've got white markings on the wings, which are especially prominent when the bird is in flight. And on our male, we've got this bright red um, breast mark. Also, uh, when the wings are raised, 
this kind of underwing portion that might be here. Um, that's a similar rose color on the male. And on the female, she's actually got like a yellowish orange uh, underwing, uh, not shown in these pictures. The female is a little bit trickier just in general to identify. Uh, she's brown and streaky, kind of like a sparrow, but she's, she's plump, uh, not really shaped like a sparrow, and the bill is huge, unlike a sparrow. The only thing you might confuse the female rose-breasted grosbeak with is the um, purple finch, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, the reason why these two birds are so distinctive from the other kind of brown streaky birds is this like bright white supercilium uh, coupled with this fat bill typical of finches and cardinalids. So this white supercilium and the fat bill tells you it's one of the two. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit more, but the fact that it's, it's quite large is going to tell you that it's a rose-breasted grosbeak. As for vocals, <clears throat> let's return to our robin again uh, and listen to that, that kind of clear, metallic, uh, cheery, cheerio, cheerily. Now, just like our scarlet tanager was a robin that had a sore throat, the rose-breasted grosbeak is a robin that's taken voice lessons. It's much sweeter. Uh, it's much uh, just prettier in general. Um, so here is the rose-breasted grosbeak singing almost a robin-like song, but much more beautiful. And here's an individual singing an extended song. Also note that both the male and the female rose-breasted grosbeak can produce a, a pick or an eek call. I learned it as a, as a pick call. And often the song and the call are mixed together, so a male that's singing will produce those eek calls as well. Okay, the Baltimore Oriole is another bird that's reasonably common in our study area. Uh, they produce a wide array of different vocalizations that we're going to talk about in a minute, but visually it's pretty easy to identify. Um, <clears throat> both our male and our female uh, are, are kind of a warm tone, uh, essentially orange in both, both sexes. Um, and we have orange on the tail on both sexes uh, and some orange on the wings uh, and so forth. Uh, the main differences come in the black areas. Um, on our male, we've got a black hood, <clears throat> uh, black wings with white markings. The female, we have similar white markings. <clears throat> However, uh, the the black is essentially replaced with grayish brown uh, and even some orange on the, uh, the nape. Probably also worth noting that the females are quite variable. Um, this one is particularly drab, but some females can have more of a hood uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, as for, um, let's probably note the behavior. Uh, these guys tend to stay up in the canopy. Uh, in fact, the only time I ever see Orioles coming down from the canopy is when they're collecting nesting material. So that's also good to know. Uh, but vocalizations, uh, Baltimore Orioles are a little bit tricky. Uh, the reason that they're tricky is because their calls and, and songs are so variable, uh, particularly the song. So the male song is some sort of very clear whistle. That tends to be the only real pattern. Uh, and they'll either give them singly or they'll give them in a short like pattern. The thing that makes it tricky, uh, that's a little deceiving to uh, new new birders, is that they often will pick a pattern, like a single male will pick a pattern of whistles and like repeat it over and over and over. And you might be tempted to think, okay, that's like the pattern of the song. And you might memorize the pattern and notice that the next male is totally different. The key is not the pattern, but it's the, the quality of the notes. So it's these clear whistles, and when they're given singly, it's a little easier to, to tell. So I'm going to play you a number of different males and focus in on the quality of the song, not so much the pattern.
Here's another male. And another male. Notice with that last male, we get a lot of like single clear notes, and they do that often as well. That might be all bird will do. I encourage you to go on the internet and listen to a, a variety of different Baltimore Oriole vocalizations so to get familiar with what they sound like. Also note that they produce a ton of different calls, um, such as these ones, or these. But the main one that I want you to know is the, the chatter. So this is a call of uh, two, uh, uh, two Baltimore Orioles interacting, and it's kind of an aggressive interaction. Okay, the brown-headed cowbird. Brown-headed cowbirds are kind of thought of as sort of a nasty bird uh, by many people because it's a brood parasite. That is, the female brown-headed cowbird uh, lays her eggs into the nests of other songbirds, uh, and those young are essentially raised in a cuckoo-like fashion. Uh, unlike the cuckoos of Europe, uh, which are a little bit worse, uh, the brown-headed cowbird does not uh, evict the other nestlings uh, whereas a cuckoo, a European cuckoo, uh, that when the chick hatches it, it knocks all the other eggs out. Uh, the cowbird steals a single egg uh, with when she lays her own. Um, that way the bird doesn't notice that there's a different number of eggs, um, but the chick essentially uh, hangs out with its nestmates the entire time. Uh, visually speaking, this bird is not terribly hard to identify. Our male is like a glossy black, uh, either green or purplish kind of color. Um, and our female is really plain, uh, a lot like our indigo bunting. We'll talk about this more. The thing to note here is that um, unlike an indigo bunting, this bird's quite large. We've got no hint of blue anywhere in here like an indigo, um, and maybe even faint streaking uh, on occasion. The vocals are also not too hard. Uh, the male has this very weird song. It's kind of short and easy to miss. Uh, but it's actually very complicated. Um, the bird's producing multiple notes at the same time and produces a, a gluck gluck glee, or I've also heard it described as gurgle z. Also, uh, pretty important to note are the the Female, uh, I guess uh, both sexes produce these, these chatters. Females make them a lot. Um, these sort of uh, rising bubbly trills. And often males will sing and females will uh, do these chatter calls. Moving along to the red-winged blackbird, this is a, a really fun one. Uh, most people are, are familiar when they start the project with red-winged blackbirds, and I would imagine that you are as well. Uh, the male is, is a solid black color uh, on the top and the bottom. The only thing that really uh, deviates from that is this, this red and, and yellow epaulette region of the wing. Uh, the female looks very much different, uh, essentially like a large sparrow. Uh, she's very streaky overall, under tail, breast, back, wings, head, everywhere. Um, the thing to notice is that she's got this kind of peachy color uh, around the face, which is pretty diagnostic for the red-winged blackbird. The habitat also is pretty distinctive. They tend to be found uh, near some kind of wetland, uh, occasionally grasslands as well. Um, but we, we tend to only see them around uh, wetlands in our study area. 
The song is a uh, variable, um, but I learned it as a sort of a metallic uh, electric concrete or herbal tea. Here's an example of a, a singing male. But notice that there's a lot of variation. Here's a different male. They also produce a wide variety of calls that I don't expect you to know. Uh, the, the cluck is probably the best one to know. Uh, if, if I were going to learn one, it would probably be this. And that's given by uh, either sex, but here are a sampling of the other calls that they can produce. The next blackbird is the common grackle. Grackles are pretty cool. Uh, they're a very large, very uh, loud uh, blackbird. They tend to have an affinity for um, conifer trees, uh, but are, are somewhat of a generalist. Um, it's glossy black overall, uh, has a light colored iris. Um, really actually quite an attractive bird. Uh, males and females are very similar. Uh, the male has this large, um, sort of tail that's that's kind of a, a weird dimension it sort of folds down in the center uh, and the female has a less pronounced version of the t same tail <clears throat> shorter uh, and less deep of a of a groove in the tail there um, the calls um, they produce a variety of calls that actually sound like the the cluck of a red-winged blackbird uh, here's an example of a, a grackle cluck which is deeper than that of the blackbird Uh, and of course, like most of these, they produce a song, which tends to be kind of a, a mechanical, uh, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce what I've got written on the screen, but just a, an obnoxious kind of noise. I think it's actually pretty cool, but a very short little um, noise. And like many blackbirds, they're quite gregarious, so here's a group of them. Okay, the next blackbird, uh, followed by the one uh, we're going to talk about afterwards, are, are both mostly grassland birds. Uh, the eastern meadowlark is pretty straightforward. We've kind of got a stripy, sparrow-like back, but a really short tail on very long pink legs. Uh, yellow breast and belly and face <clears throat> gives this away as an eastern meadowlark. We've got this black V on the breast, as well as the uh, striped face. A very long pointed bill, uh, eastern meadowlark. Uh, and the song is a pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, I've never heard a good mnemonic for it, but the one that I kind of made up in my own mind is, Spring is finally here. And that pattern is pretty consistent. They also produce a, a sort of a rising uh, chatter call. It's also probably worth noting that eastern meadowlarks aren't hugely common in our study area, but they're worth knowing especially in the southern Appalachian region. 
The final of our blackbirds is the bobolink. Male bobolinks are pretty distinctive, uh, hard to uh, confuse with anything else. We've got a, kind of a black front on our bird, um, uh, an interesting pattern on the wings, black tail. We've got a white rump uh, and a white back, as well as this white mark on the wings, uh, as well as this kind of cream colored afro. <clears throat> really strange looking bird. Uh, our females are, are a little bit trickier. They look a lot like a sparrow, except we've got a pointed tail, um, kind of a more slender appearance than, than the typical sparrow, uh, not as much streaking, <coughs> excuse me, as well as just kind of this creamy overall color on our uh, bobolink female. The song is also pretty easy. Uh, it's just a very series of, uh, very beautiful series of rich notes uh, sounding somewhat like fit, 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 bobolink, bobolink, and just a mixture of those types of things with even more complex notes thrown in uh, that almost to me have a, a barn swallow type quality. Um, so instead of me attempting to describe it, I'm going to play you several. Really, uh, although a very complex song, it's pretty distinctive. There's not a lot out there that sounds like a bobolink. Moving into the finch group. Uh, the American goldfinch is a very easy one to identify. Uh, we're all yellow, on uh, our male and female. Both sexes have darker colored wings and tail. Uh, the males, uh, much, much like some species before, have black wings and tail. Females have sort of a gray-brown. Uh, our male American goldfinch has a black forehead, and the female has uh, a non-colored non forehead, essentially just yellow like the base color. <clears throat> Both sexes have kind of these pinkish-orange legs and orange bills, uh, pretty easy to identify. They're pretty stocky little birds, even though they're, they're quite small, warbler-sized birds. They're very, like, fat, and they have pretty short legs, uh, so pretty easy to identify. Um... We're going to start by talking about the vocals uh, with the calls rather than the song because I think that'll make things a little bit easier. So two calls that the goldfinch produces um, that, that are quite distinctive are the baby and the potato chip calls. So here are some of those. That's the baby call. The other call to know is the potato chip, or as I learned it, the perchicory call. And they often give this in flight, but not necessarily. And it sounds like a very like high and light potato chip, or perchicory. Now the reason we're talking about the calls before we talk about the songs, because the goldfinch's song is very complex. However, one thing that makes the goldfinch song a little bit easier is that they often incorporate the baby and the potato chip into the song itself. You can hear at the beginning of that one, it starts with the potato chip. And here's one that begins with the baby. The next finch we're going to talk about is the house finch. The house finch is, is pretty easy, uh, most because a lot of people are already familiar with it. Uh, visually speaking, uh, we've got a kind of a sparrow-like bird overall. Our female and male look almost the same uh, in that we're kind of just plain streaky with a brown streaked head uh, with no obvious like breaks in the streaks on um, both sexes. Uh, our male, of course, has a, a kind of a reddish blush uh, over this region. Uh, as well as a reddish uh, rump, which you often can't see. Uh, but, uh, but not too, too difficult uh, visually. 
we've also got kind of this uh, this short little nubby uh, bill here. As for the song, we've got a rich kind of up and down a series of burry, uh, very beautiful, but burry notes. Um, <clears throat> it tends to be pretty familiar to most people because you hear these birds around buildings a lot. And there are a lot of these rich kind of slurred back and forth notes in the song. Also probably worth noting are the calls. <clears throat> the calls essentially to me sound like just a single note from the song. Moving on to the purple finch. Purple finches are a little bit tricky for some people <clears throat> because they look so similar to the house finch. However, on our purple finch, we see much more extensive purple, uh, this reddish color, and it's even into the tertiary flight feathers, our coverts, uh, and well down into our mantle. And remember on our house finch how we had a little spot of red down into the rump? Uh, this bird has uh, red going all the way down even into the tail feathers, and, and instead of just being restricted to the breast, we've got this purplish color extending well down into the flanks. Female house finches, or excuse me, purple finches are very similar to house finches. However, uh, remember our purple finch, or wow, our house finch had kind of this essentially unmarked head. It was streaked, but it was consistently streaked. On our purple finch, we've got a white collared mallard and a very light supercilium. The song is also a little bit tricky, but not too bad. Uh, very similar to the house finch. However, it's, it's richer, it's faster, and it's more slurred. It's much sweeter overall. In fact, we're actually more likely to encounter purple finches on our bird surveys because we tend to be out in the forest where these birds are more common. Okay, moving on to our final bird in this, uh, this video, the pine siskin. Pine siskins are pretty easy to identify. Uh, it kind of looks like a, a, a house finch or a, a purple finch maybe, or maybe a sparrow. Uh, but the thing that's distinctive is we got clear white wing bars uh, streaking well down into the flanks like some of the other finches. But these white uh, shafts on the primary flight feathers are, are actually quite distinctive and easy to see from a long ways away. We also see this very like acute tipped bill, almost more like a, like a warbler. Uh, so that gives us our pine siskin. They're not terribly common, but uh, we do see them regularly, and the vocalizations are also pretty easy. We've got an electric rising zree, and they produce this often in concert with a song, which we're not going to worry about, because they do regularly just produce it on its own. Additionally, they produce these squeaky chee chee calls. Okay, <clears throat> a couple of birds to review here. As promised, we've got our rose-breasted grosbeak here on the left and our, our purple finch on the, uh, the right here. So notice a couple of things here. They're a little tricky because they're both kind of brown and streaky, uh, and both of them have light superciliums and light mallards. <clears throat> but on our grosbeak, we routinely have uh, white wing bars, uh, and the streaking is far less uh, extensive than on our purple finch. The final thing to note is the size. The rose-breasted grosbeak is considerably larger than the purple finch. And our second pair of birds that are uh, a little bit tricky uh, are the brown-headed cowbird and indigo bunting. Brown-headed cowbird, shown here on the left, often has like these faint streaks, but not always. Um, but the size, again, is, is quite different. We've got our very small indigo bunting, our large cowbird, um, Indigo buntings often have just a blush of blue mixed in, which is never found on the cowbird. 
Uh, the bill is proportionally flatter and skinnier on our indigo bunting, where it's it's quite a bit larger on our uh, cowbird. Um, yeah, I think that about does it for me. Um, thanks for watching. Be sure to send me an email if you have any questions about any of these individual birds or anything at all. Uh, remember that this is meant to be a supplement uh, to your your already instated bird learning uh, experience. Uh, it should help as a refresher, but should not be the sole uh, uh, piece of information for learning your, uh, your birds for the seed project. Uh, and also remember that there's no substitute for time in the field. Uh, get out as much as you can and uh, look for some of these birds. Um, I think that'll do her, and uh, have a great day.